Welcome, and today we're going to look at Assessment Component 1.3, which is entitled Models of Criminal Justice. And in this component, we're going to be looking at two models of criminal justice, the due process and the crime control model. Now, these come up in the exam virtually every single year in the Unit 4 paper. And basically, you need to know the key elements of each of these two models for criminal justice. They're really straightforward, it's just a matter of learning them. So let's crack on and see if we can understand these two theories of crime control. So the two theories are called crime control and due process. And they were put forward by this guy here, Herbert Leslie Packer. He was an American law professor and criminologist, and his key book was entitled The Limits of Criminal Sanction, published in 1968. And in it, he proposed that there were two models of the criminal justice system. So wherever you went in the world, you could see these two models in some shape or form within the criminal justice system. Some countries move more towards one model, some countries move more towards another model. At the same time, these two models are always vying together um, for control of the criminal justice system and also for policy within the criminal justice system. So there's his book. And of course, these models are extremely influential in criminology and have informed criminal policy debates and as I said, they represent these two competing systems of values that are there within the criminal justice system. And because the two models, the crime control and the due process model, are so very different, and you'll see that as we go through, they are extremely different, they create tension. And you can see that tension within the criminal justice system and, of course, within the policies that the government is setting for the criminal justice system. So without further ado, let's have a look at our first model, which is the crime control model. So the key features of the crime control model are as follows. And perhaps this is the most important one. So as far as the crime control model is concerned, the repression of crime is the most important function of the criminal justice system. So all it's about is stamping out crime. And the reason that's so important, because if you stamp out crime, if you have a low crime rate, then you have a society which is free, which everyone can live in without fear of crime. They can get on with their get on with their lives without being interfered with from by criminals, etc. So that is what society is all about, living harmoniously together, and anything that deviates from that, you repress, you stamp out. And the crime control model focuses on victims' rights. So in the crime control model, it's the rights of the victim, the innocent people who have had crimes inflicted upon them. They are the people that should, should take priority within the criminal justice system, not the people that have gone against the system, those people who've deviated from the norm, those people who've chosen to commit crime. They should not take priority. It should always be the victims. And in order to repress crime, in order to vindicate victims' rights, obviously you need the police to have the powers to do their job. So generally in a crime control model, police powers are expanded. It's easier for the police to investigate, it's easier for them to arrest, to search, to seize, to convict. That's what a crime control model is all about. And that also means that legal technicalities that stop the police from doing investigation, arresting, searching, seizing and conviction. Any technicality, legal technicality that stops them doing this job should be eliminated. You get rid of them. You don't want that because that stops you from repressing crime. So legal technicalities that handcuff the police, that stop them doing their job, you get rid of in a crime control model. And 
the way to think about the criminal justice uh, process under a crime control model, think of it like an assembly line or a conveyor belt. It's moving cases swiftly along towards their disposition, towards their end. And under a crime control model, the assumption is that if the police have made an arrest and a prosecutor has filed criminal charges, then the accused is probably guilty because the police and the prosecutors, their fact finding is reliable. That is the assumption, that's the, um, the preconception that's there with a prime control model. And obviously, the main objective of the criminal justice process should be to discover the truth and establish the factual guilt of the accused. Now, I'm going to talk about the difference between factual guilt and legal guilt a little later on. But just hold on to that idea about what factual guilt is. It just means the person did it. OK, so <clears throat> if we take our crime control model, again, I said, think of it like a conveyor belt or an assembly line. You arrest the person, you get them um, up, in, up in court as soon as possible, and you get them behind bars as soon as possible. It's a straight, easy process that's quick and efficient. That is the crime control model. <coughs> now, there's some issues with the crime control model. Um, you know, you will see if as police powers go up, more stopping and searching, um, less need for warrants and those sort of things. And of course, some people have said, well, if you're relying on the police um, and you're not worrying too much about um, <coughs> too much about uh, legal guilt as opposed to factual guilt, the police will be able to falsify ev uh, 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 reports. They could tamper with evidence. Um, you've got you can have selective witness statements. And there's a danger of innocent people being locked up. And so because of that, other people propose the due process model. So the due process model is poles apart from crime control. <coughs> Excuse me. Under the due process model, the most important function of criminal justice is to provide a due process, a correct process, fundamental fairness under the law, so that innocent people do not get locked up. And the criminal justice system should concentrate on the rights of the defendant, not the victim. And remember, um, Packer was writing in America, so he refers to the Bill of Rights, and the Bill of Rights in America expressly provides for the protection of defendants' rights, and we have the same thing in this country as well. So it's defendants' rights that need to be protected under the criminal justice system, not victims' rights. Defendants are the priority. And police powers, therefore, should be limited to, in order to prevent official oppression of the individual, to stop non-stop stop and searches, uh, not having to have a warrant, etc, etc, etc. At the same time, it's also important to realise that constitutional rights aren't just technicalities. The authorities of the criminal justice system have to be held accountable under a due process model. They've got to follow rules. They've got to follow procedures. They've got to follow guidelines. They've got to be fair. They've got to be consistent. And if they're not, they have to be held to account. And in this country, we have the Independent Office of Police Conduct, the IOPC. And you can see here, this is, I've taken this directly from the website. We investigate the most serious and sensitive incidents and allegations involving the police find out more about what we do. So the police are, if they've, if they fail to do something properly, they are held accountable. Now, whereas the crime control model is like a conveyor belt, think of the due process model as an obstacle course. It consists of lots of impediments that take the form of procedural safeguards that serve to protect the factually innocent and also to try and convict the factually guilty. And under the due process model, the government shouldn't hold a person guilty solely on the basis of facts. They can only be found guilty if the government has followed legal procedures in its fact finding. And this is the difference between factual guilt and legal guilt. 
Under the due process model, you may know that the person has done the crime, but unless you can prove it legally in a court of law, they remain innocent. So that is the key difference between the guilt within the due process and the crime control model. For crime control, they're just bothered about factual guilt. Did they do it? Yes, right, bang them up. In due process, did they do it? Well, they may have done, but we need to prove it legally beyond all reasonable doubt. So when we think about our due process model, it's like a conveyor belt in here or like an obstacle course. Here I've got my little obstacle course and it's like an impediment. Every single one of these little things here is a barrier, a hoop that people have got to jump through in order to get that prisoner into prison, unlike the conveyor belt of the crime control um, method. So on arrest, you know, they might be asking, did the uh, defendant have the right, have their rights read to them? Were they Mirandaed? Um, were they charged within 24 hours of arrest? Was the evidence collected properly? Was the evidence stored properly? Have the CPS run the full code test if we're in the UK? Has the defendant got appropriate legal representation? Has the prosecution shared all the evidence with the defence? Have an unbiased jury been selected for the case? Was the trial conducted fairly by the judge? And did the sentence um, follow legal guidelines. If all those hoops have been jumped through and we still got a guilty verdict, then fine, the person goes to prison. But that's what we mean by legally guilty. All those things have got to be followed. It's not enough just to say they did it. You've got to prove it beyond all reasonable doubt. So that is the due process model. Now, when it comes to evaluating these models, it's an inexact science, really, because to say that one of these models is better than the other is actually you just making a value judgment based on your personal beliefs. So it would be true to say that the crime control model basically reflects conservative values. It's more right wing, while the due process model reflects more liberal values. It's more left wing. So <coughs> political climate very much determines and shapes criminal justice policy at any specific time. So when we're in the 60s, which is more politically liberal, you would see more um, policies that are linked to due process predominating within the criminal justice system. But from the mid 70s to really now, um, 2022, conservatism has generally held sway as the dominant political philosophy. And so many conservatives have formulated criminal justice policies in the image of a crime control model. So the way to think about this, I suppose, is like this Venn diagram. You've got crime control here, which has a conservative approach. It generally goes for strict punishment and it's prioritizing public order. And our due process is forming a liberal approach it's concerned more about rehabilitation of offenders and their rights and prioritizing individual rights. But that's not to say that the two don't have some common ground. Certainly, it would be true to say that both see crime reduction as a focus of their policies. And also both do go along with punishment for breaking the law. It's how you assess guilt that is important. So there is some common ground between the two policies. So in my final slide, what I've done is um, just put together side by side the two models so you can see if you get a question on this, how you might phrase it. So if we're talking about the primary goals of the two models, well, if we're crime control, it's all about catching, convicting and punishing the offenders, whereas for the due process, it's about protecting the innocent and limiting governmental power. The crime control model focuses on controlling crime, repression of criminal conduct, whereas the due process model is focusing on due process and respect of individual rights. The mood of the crime control model is uncertainty. The onus is on the defence, really, to prove the innocence 
of uh, the accused. Whereas if we move over to the due process model, it's a much more skeptical mood. The onus is on the prosecution to prove the guilt of the accused. It's assembly line justice for the crime control model because the process, it processes the cases quickly and efficiently in order to get a conviction. Whereas with a due process model, we have obstacle course justice. Numerous obstacles are presented to prevent errors and wrongful convictions. The crime control model is concerned with factual guilt, so it assumes that the person arrested and charged is probably guilty. It relies on informal, non-adjudicative, which means non-legal fact-finding, primarily by the police and prosecutors, whereas the due process model is concerned with legal guilt, the assumption that someone's innocent until proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. So it's relying on formal, adjudicative, so legal processes, that adversarial fact-finding um, system that we have within our courts. And the crime control is all about quick processing of offenders to achieve uh, justice for victims and society as a whole, whereas the due process model is slow and deliberate so that the dignity and autonomy of both the accused and the system are preserved. Both have their strengths, both have their weaknesses. You make your own decisions, but you can see how these two models have impacted on society as a whole. And you might think about what have we got in this country? I would argue the UK at the moment. We follow within our courts a very due process model, but some of our policies surrounding crime are increasingly more crime control, tough on crime, tough on the causes of crime, etc. So you make your own minds up. You need to know that for the exam. This is the key bit you need to know for the exam. Hope you found that useful and I'll see you soon for my next video. Take care.